Hi, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of the Fresh Cut Flowers webinar. This week's topic, or this month's topic, sorry, is the seasonal flowers. And today's host is Emma Bradford, who will be guiding us through the topics. Any questions, please use the chat, and we'll answer all of the questions at the end. This webinar has been recorded, and you'll be receiving the link in your emails. Emma, do you want to take it away? Yes. Thank you, Mark. Hello and welcome to the third webinar in our series. So my name is Emma Bradford and today I will be talking to you about seasonal flowers. So going over our little roadmap of where I'll be taking you today. Firstly, I will discuss what makes flowers seasonal. Then when and where they are grown. And then I'll focus on a few popular seasonal flowers. I'll briefly go over the transportation of flowers over long distance, and then finish with everybody's favorite, the fun facts. So what makes flowers bloom at certain times of the year? Or in other words, what makes them seasonal? Well, if you watched the last webinar on spring flowers, you'll remember that I talked about photo period and vernalization. Now, photo period is just a sciencey way of saying day length, so short days or long days. And vernalization is a sciencey way of describing the period of cold temperatures that some plants require to trigger them to flower. Now, going back to photo period, as I mentioned last month, it's not actually the amount of daylight a plant gets that triggers them to flower. It's actually the length of the nighttime. So a plant which is triggered to flower during short days can be more accurately described as a long night plant. Now to prove this, experiments were done where short day plants were exposed to the same day length and then exposed to either one long continuous night or two short nights interrupted by a flash of light. And what they found was, even though both sets of plants were exposed to the same day length, only the ones which were given a long interrupted night actually bloomed. So night length is actually the critical factor to triggering flowers. So long day plants, on the other hand, can be triggered to flower when their nighttime is interrupted by a flash of light, making two short nights, because they need short nights in order to flower. So what does all that even mean? Well, in nature, plants are triggered to flower by day length, temperature, or a combination of the two. But when cultivating plants, we can actually use this knowledge to trigger flowers to bloom out of their natural season. Now, if you're a king gardener, you will know that the goal of many king gardeners is to create a garden in which there is always something in bloom or of interest throughout the year. Now, if you're lucky enough to live between the tropics, then this will be much easier for you to achieve. But for those of us who live with definite seasons, we must choose our plants based on when they are triggered to flower. So spring flowers, for instance, are triggered by short days followed by longer days. And of course, temperature plays a part as well. Summer flowers, on the other hand, are triggered by long days and short nights. And then autumn flowers are triggered by short days, which follow long days. So they will grow during the longer days of spring and summer, but they need the short days of autumn to actually trigger the blooming. Now, some short day plants, we can be lucky, will actually bloom twice in a year. So some short day plants will actually bloom once in the spring and then again in the autumn when the days get shorter again. Okay, so 
Let's briefly veer away from botanical matters for a moment and think physics for a bit. Now, most of you will remember learning about the seasons and why they happen in elementary school. So let's go back there for a little while. As you all know, the Earth revolves around the sun while spinning on a tilted axis. And that's why we get days and nights and seasons. So because of the tilt, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere experience opposite seasons. So when it's summer in the northern hemisphere, it's actually wintertime in the southern hemisphere. Now, because of the tilt of the Earth, the sun's rays do not fall on the northern and southern hemispheres equally. So picture shining a beam of light onto a yoga ball or a soccer ball, for example. If you hold it perfectly level and move it between the middle or the widest part of the ball and the top or bottom, the circle of light that will fall on the ball will elongate into an ellipse the further you move it up or down. Now, if you can't picture this, I've actually added a pictorial on the left for you to see, which shows exactly the same thing. On the right hand side, you will see a diagram of the area that the same beam of light from the sun will cover on the globe in December or July. So the same amount of the sun's energy will fall on every spot, but because the areas are larger or smaller, the sun's rays will be weaker or stronger. Okay. Think of it this way. So I've given you six pots of yellow paint and asked you to color in the six different areas as shown. Now, the amount of paint you have for each area is exactly the same, and you must use up all of the paint for each area. So if the area is smaller, like on the equator, you'll be able to completely cover it, maybe even paint more than one coat. So it's really well covered and it will give you a really strong color. However, if the area is bigger, you may only be able to paint one thin coat, giving you a much fainter color. Okay, now think of the paint as sun. Where the earth is, earth is closer to the sun, the beam will be directly overhead, covering a smaller area, and it will be more intense. Where the Earth is further away from the sun, the beam will cover a larger area and be less intense. Okay, now with all of that in mind, let's return to all things botanical once again and discuss where flowers grow globally. Now, because the seasons are reversed between the northern and southern hemispheres, seasonal flowers can be available almost year round. So to explain the table you are looking at right now, you will see there is a distinction between astronomical and meteorological seasonal calendars. Now, the astronomical seasons are set at fixed points throughout the year, and these are the equinoxes and the solstices. So the, the winter solstice, for instance, marks the shortest day of the year. The summer solstice marks the longest day of the year. And in between the two solstices, there are the spring and autumn equinoxes, which mark the point at which the length of the days and nights are roughly equal. The meteorological seasonal calendar, on the other hand, is based on annual temperature and the calendar months and fall more in line with the observable seasons that we actually experience. So looking back at the table, you can clearly see how the seasons are reversed between the northern and southern hemispheres. But what does that actually mean for flower growers? Well, it means that seasonal flowers will naturally bloom at different time in the year, depending on which hemisphere they are grown in. So if we use peonies as an example, we could source them all year round if we wanted to, 
by shipping stems between the two hemispheres. So, what happens at the equator, I hear you ask? Well, the area around the equator is rather special because this area doesn't experience dramatic seasonal changes and the day lengths are also more consistent throughout the year. These two factors mean that many crops can be grown year round, including roses. And that's why Colombia, Ecuador, Kenya and Ethiopia, just to name a few places, are such good growing areas for flowers. So moving on, let's look at a few popular seasonal crops, starting with peonies, which is a very popular summer flower. Now, typically peonies are harvested in bud with some color showing. The ripeness of a peony is determined by first visual inspection and then by feel or touch to determine how soft or hard it is. The correct peony harvest stage can be tricky to assess and harvesting them too green or hard or too ripe or soft can negatively impact vase life. So buds that are cut too soon may not actually open correctly and those that are cut too ripe might actually open too soon. Now peonies can be harvested and stored dry in a good cold store at about one to three degrees. When they're ready to use, you just need to recut the stems and hydrate them with a hydration or transit solution. Now, peonies do have some specific issues that are unique to them. And one of those is a phenomenon called natural petal browning. Now, natural petal browning is totally unrelated to any diseases and it manifests itself in the outer petals turning a pale brown and, and a papery sort of type of thing. Peonies can develop botrytis just as roses do, but the browning due to botrytis is, is darker in color and it spreads very quickly throughout the flower base where all the nutrients are. And then lastly, the third type of browning that peonies can get, they can develop patches of very dark browning on the sepals or the outer petals, usually about the size of a, a two euro piece or a 50 pence piece or a 50 cents piece sort of a thing. And this dark spot uh, will not spread. It'll just stay that same size. Now, if you see that, that could be a sign of alternaria on the outside of the bud. And then the next thing to be aware of of with peonies are variety differences. So Sarah Bernhardt is the most widely cultivated variety of peony. And this is the one that you see on the slide uh, on the top right and in the bottom right. There are lots of other varieties available um, and they may look different at the same harvest stage. So if you look at the photos on the bottom, the one on the left is a variety called Duchesse de Namur, and that's at its harvest stage. And then on the one on the right, as I said, shows all the opening stages of Sarah Bernhardt from harvest stage on the left to open on the right. Now you can see that when in bud, the sepals of Sarah Bernhardt fully enclose the petals, but on Duchesse de Namur, the sepals are smaller and the petals show through more. This is fine and normal, it's just an example of variety differences, that's all. And then a third variety, which behaves completely differently, is coral charm. Now, coral charm is a really lovely, bright coral pink um, when it's freshly opened, but then it fades to a delicate cream color over its vase life. And the other good thing about coral charm is that it rarely is affected by that natural petal browning. Moving on to Delphinium and Larkspur. Now, these are two very closely related genera. That's why we tend to put them together. These are probably as close to a blue flower as you will actually get in cut flowers. Now, the most important thing to know about Delphiniums is that they are very ethylene sensitive and they must, must be treated with an anti-ethylene product directly after harvest 
to prevent flower shatter. Other than that, you would follow your other general care and handling steps. So by storing them on a transit or hydration solution at one to three degrees. Moving to sunflowers. Now, sunflowers are most often harvested at stage one or two. So if you look at the picture on the bottom, um, it goes from left to right, all the cut flower stages from one to five. Now, even though they're harvested at stage one or two, the opening stage can actually be increased by storing them in ambient until they reach the correct opening stage. You must be sure to always use a hydration or transit solution directly after harvesting. So you would harvest them directly into a solution. And the Floralife Easy Dose Economy Transit Solution works particularly well on sunflowers. One thing to note about sunflowers is that when they are mixed with other flowers, sunflowers can introduce a lot of bacteria into the water. And that's simply because they are field grown. And if you've ever looked at the stem of a sunflower, there are lots and lots of hairs on the stems. And those hairs just increase the surface area that bacteria can be on. So when using sunflowers, observing correct hygiene protocols is particularly important. So dahlias. Dahlias are a member of the Asteraceae family. And if you watched the first webinar, Botany 101, you will remember that flowers in this family are not actually individual flowers, but a collection of flowers called a head. So what looks like the petals are actually each one individual flowers called ray flowers or disc flowers. Now, dahlias are relatively short-lived flowers once harvested, making them ideal for weddings or events, where they will add a pop of instant color but not need to last over several days. They also make really good kitchen garden flowers. So they will bloom throughout the season, giving you a plentiful supply of cut flowers for your home. So when dahlias begin to fade, what they do is the outer petals or the, the ray flowers tend to brown first, slowly moving inward to the inner flowers. So in a nutshell, it will brown from the outside in. Now, to keep your dahlias fresher longer, always use flower food. And what you can also do is spray them with an anti-transpirant, such as a Floralife Finishing Touch or Crowning Glory. So, flowers that are transported over long distances typically travel one of two ways, either by air or by sea. Now, both methods have their advantages and disadvantages. So with air freight, the transit time between leaving the farm to arriving at their destination can be as little as 24 hours. However, the flowers can be exposed to high temperatures before, during and after the flights due to poor temperature control. But with sea freight, on the other hand, transit times are much slower and they can take up to 21 days but the temperature control is much more consistent. So if you are looking at shipping flowers over long distance, there are a few things to consider. Firstly, you must put good quality in to have any chance of getting good quality out. So the pre-harvest conditions must be optimal and the best varieties for shipping selected. And then other pre-shipping requirements are good hygiene, always using a correctly dosed post-harvest solution made with clean water, strictly observing correct harvest stage, removing all field heat as soon as possible, storing all your packaging materials in a chiller so they're pre-chilled to help maintain the cold chain, and using antibotrytis and antiethylene products to protect the stems during transit. Most importantly, cool chain, cool chain, cool chain.
Maintaining your core chain will be the most beneficial thing you can do for your flowers during transit. And then on arrival, well, you would hydrate all stems with a 200 level transit solution. Now, why do I recommend the transit solution here instead of just a hydration solution? Well, imagine you want to dye or color a flower. In order to do that, you need an uptake solution with dye in it and a thirsty flower. If a flower is slightly thirsty, it will uptake the dye up the stem and into the flower very quickly. However, if you try the same technique on flowers which have just had a drink and the stems are already full of water, it would take much longer for the dye to reach the flower as the stem won't need to uptake as much. And it's the same with flower food. So because a transit solution has more sugar in it than a hydration solution, when a slightly thirsty flowers uptake it, the sugar will travel directly up to the flower where it's needed the most. Now, it's also very important is allowing a bit of space in between your bunches when they are hydrating. Don't be tempted to cram them all in too tightly into one bucket. And this is because when they arrive, they'll be slightly dehydrated, meaning the vacuoles in each cell will be slightly flaccid or soft. But when they drink up the transit solution, the vacuoles will fill with water and expand, making each cell turgid again. And the flowers will expand a little. If they don't have enough room, this expansion can cause them to push up against each other, a bit like commuters in a packed train. And that could lead to mechanical damage on your flowers. So, fun facts. Now, long before humans even began thinking about moving plants around the world, some plants were already doing it for themselves. Now, the reasons plants flower and produce seeds is solely to reproduce themselves. And by the process of evolution, plants have some interesting ways of ensuring that their seeds get dispersed to increase their chance of survival. Now, here you can see six different ways in which seeds get dispersed. Now, the first one is ballistic, and that is in the top left with a squirting cucumber. You can see the seeds actually explode out of the fruit. And then by water, with some species actually grow inland, but next to rivers, they're able to drop their seeds into the river, which then floats out to sea. Then you have by passive animal carriers. By that, I mean the seeds stick to the fur of the animals. And then when the animals groom themselves much further away, the seeds drop off and then they have a new place to grow. Seeds also use wind for dispersal and then active animal carriers. And by that, I mean that the animals actually actively take a part in dispersal. So either a bird or a mammal will eat a fruit and then some distance away, they will poop out the remnants and it'll get dispersed that way. And in fact, there are some seeds which will only germinate after they've already passed through an animal first. And then lastly, by flight, where seeds have simple to complex, distant, uh, complex wing structures to maximize distance traveled. Now this time we don't have just one, but we have two fun fact slides for you. So, We've all heard of deadheading flowers to get them to rebloom, but why does it work? Well, when a flower fades and sets seeds, it sends a hormone signal down the stem, messaging the rest of the plant that it no longer needs to produce flowers, and it's time to put its energy in developing seeds instead. But by removing that head, you'll prevent this message from being sent and the plant will just continue to produce flowers over and over again. And then lastly, did you know that sunflowers actually follow the sun? I'm sure you've seen fields of sunflowers where all of the sunflowers are facing in exactly the same direction. Well, this is because 
when sunflowers are young, they actively track the sun's movement across the sky. And it's theorized the reason that they do that is <clears throat> when they're in bud, like you can see on the picture on the right, the bracts are covered over the head and those bracts will photosynthesize. And by tracking the sun, they can maximize the amount of photosynthesis that they can do. Now, some flowers only do this when they're young. They get to a point when they grow and they become static and they get stuck in that position and they, they don't track the sun anymore. But they definitely do it when they're younger up to a point. And that's our presentation for today. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Emma. Yeah, during your presentation, we did receive a few questions from our listeners. Uh, so over the next 15 minutes, we'll go over as many as we can, and you can still submit questions as we're going through them. Uh, we'll also be posting a few polls, so feel free to answer, answer them. Okay, so the first question, Emma. On summer crops, does the removal of 75% of the leaf affect face life? We do know that it does reduce fungal and bacteria development, storage and shipping. That is a good question. I think it would depend on when they mean leaf removal. Is it before being shipped? Are they shipping? Is it before being put in the bucket? Is it before being put in the vase? It, it all depends and it depends on the crop. So typically what we recommend is anything that's going to be below the water level definitely needs to be removed. Anything above needs to be kept. And the reason for that is that um, leaving the leaves on the top actually helps to move the water up the stem. So if you watch Botany 101, you'll know that the water always moves from the bottom of the stem up and the leaves help to do that by still doing a little bit of transpiration. So that's what I'd recommend. Um, if they are, there are some crops where there are certain problems on leaves and there's a reason for removing them. But in general, we recommend only removing the ones that are going to be below the water level. Great, thank you. Another question, why are some crops available year round, like roses, carnations and chrysanthemums? Good question, yeah. So those crops, just like any other, are still um, triggered by photoperiod, <clears throat> but it's where we grow them and it's the manner in which we grow them which makes them year round crops. So those three crops in particular are, are kind of the backbone of the floral industry. They're the, our go-to flowers. Chrysanthemums, they're so good in vase life and they travel really well. They really are the workhorse of the floral industry. And so the way that we grow those year round is twofold. So when they are grown around the equator, like I mentioned before, and they are sea freighted to where they need to go, the other way that they are grown is um, and artificial light to trigger them to bloom because they're such a good value crop it actually makes them commercially viable to grow them year round not everything you can do that with but those three in particular either you grow them around the equator or you grow them in glass houses in the northern or southern hemisphere but then you add lights and heating in order to trigger them to flower artificially at different times okay great thank you can all flower types grow in regions on the equator? Good question. In theory, yes. Um, there are still some flowers or species that require a cold period of vernalization to trigger to flower. So there's no reason why we couldn't grow them along the equator. But then for those particular flowers, they would need to go into a cold store uh, and have a period of darkness. Uh, so we need to trigger them to flower artificially, but we can still grow them on the equator. It's just we're doing in reverse to those flowers what we would do for the chrysanthemums, for instance, to grow them in the northern or southern hemisphere. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, one more question I see, and I, I might say this wrong. Is Alternaria contagious for other flowers in the vase? Ah, got, good question. Alternaria, yes. So that is the, the disease that we sometimes see on peonies. And Artenaria is a foliar disease, so it really would rather be on the leaves. So in peonies in specific, 
How we believe it's transmitted up to the heads is, <clears throat> so when the peonies are grown in the field, the peony buds, they actually have nectaries on the outside. So they actually exude a sugary nectar on the outside of the bud. Now what that does, it attracts ants. And what the ants will do is they will move up the plant. Um, and if there is alternaria present on the leaves, the movement of those ants from the base up to the, to the bud could actually move that alternaria from the leaves to the bud. And that's how we, we suspect that it could be transmitted. Now, if it's in the field, the alternaria probably won't do anything on the bud because it would much rather be on the leaves and that's where it's happiest. But once the peonies are harvested, then it has no option and it has to, to develop where it can. And that's why it develops on the head of some cut peonies, for instance. Now, if it's there, it will literally just be a dark patch about the size of a 50 pence piece or a two euro piece, something like that. And it won't spread any further. Now, even if that peony happens to touch another cut flower in the vase, the chances that it will actually spread to something else is very, very low. Because, again, Artenaria really would just rather be living on leaves and it's not going to affect anything else in the vase. OK, great. Thank you. So that looks like it's the end of the questions. Uh, so thank you, Emma, for the great presentation and thank you all for attending. Uh, we hope to see you at the next month's Fresh Cut webinar, which is on wedding flowers. Have a great day and we'll hopefully see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.